Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Today, I'm talking the long and short of it, writing that is, with Corey Ajmi. Corey is the award-winning author of the short story collection Life and Other Shortcomings, which features 12 interconnected pieces that span decades and settings but share characters or themes, and sometimes both. An advocate for women's empowerment, Corey grew up in New Orleans and now makes her home in New York City. A wife, mother, and grandmother, she also finds fulfillment in volunteer work, cooking, drawing, biking, and hiking. Her personal essays have appeared in dozens of publications. Life and Other Shortcomings has been the recipient of multiple accolades and honors, including an International Book Award, an American Fiction Award, and an IBPA Ben Franklin Award. Kirkus called the book a compelling collection that captures the mystery and menace beneath love and family life. Now, Cori Ajmi tells us about finding her writer's voice and how that allowed her to explore the mystery and menace that lies at the very heart of life and other shortcomings. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Central Booking. Today, I am delighted to be in conversation with Cori Ajmi, who is the award-winning author of the short story collection, Life and Other Shortcomings. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm thrilled to have you here. And I have to say, you know, they tell you not to judge a book by its cover, and they probably say don't judge a book by its title, but I love everything about this book, and I think the title is absolutely terrific. Um, it's one of those titles that it's like you can't wait to read the book and wonder how it's going to live up to that, um, and it certainly does. So let me start with what is probably the obvious. I mentioned that this is a short story collection, and many of the short stories are actually interconnected, um, so you will find common places between them. So sometimes it's, you know, character, sometimes it's theme, sometimes it's both. I'm wondering if you can tell us what you see as the unifying elements to these stories in this book. Um, definitely, um, there's, there's some themes that run through the whole book. And so um, I think in general, all the stories do explore similar topics, whether it be relationships, marriage, patriarchy, um, just the struggles of people's lives. And I think that's what unifies the stories overall. And I was going to say, who can't relate to that, right? I mean... Every day is a struggle for all of us, you know, I think in some way. Uh, and I thought to ask you too, you know, what I love about a collection like this is each story, you know, stands alone, but there's yeah. also sort of a collective totality. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how you see these both as individual pieces and as something that adds to a collective whole. And then if you have advice to readers as to how they should read this, should they read it in order? Does it matter if they read out of order? What are your thoughts on this having actually written the collection? Yes. Well, the stories were actually written one by one as standalone pieces. Uh, each one was published, uh, you know, months apart from the one before it. And um, it took some time after there were a bunch of stories out in the world. I just felt like they should be together. The characters would know one another, that the themes were similar, if not the same. And I wanted them to live in the same book. So I set to doing that. And that was actually a really interesting and fun part of this process because um, I was able to give the stories new life by making very few changes. And um, they linked together nicely. And that was really a very fun part of this process. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, I love when you're reading a story and all of a sudden you think to yourself, wait a minute, I heard that name before. So a few of the characters, as I mentioned, reappear throughout the story, but at different times and in different circumstances, which I always find interesting because you get some insight into who they were and who they become. So I'm wondering if you can tell us what appeals to you about revisiting characters in that sense. Well, there were a lot of different aspects to that, even just in exploring who these characters were and what happened to them as time went on. And in that way, the collection in some ways reads like a novel because the characters have a longer arc. Um, but also it was interesting to me to uh, show them at different times in their lives. And we get to see what's happening in the country also, which I found so fascinating. To this, the, one of the stories is, starts in 1970 um, in the book, and one of the, the end story is like 2014. So you get like a 40 year span on, um, on what's going on, not only for these characters, but 
like I said, in the world. I wanted to ask you about how you develop your characters and hopefully I won't get this wrong, but you know, I think in the opening story dinner conversation, you know, Callie is talking about how she sort of plays this game where she'll see somebody and she'll sort of create a backstory for them based on, you know, how they look and how they present themselves. And I'm wondering if, if you do that as well, what is your process for developing your characters? Well, I definitely do that. Um, <laughs> and I, I love to tell this story because I just think this was the spark for me. Um, when I first decided to try to write, I went to Gotham Writers Workshop. And one of the very first assignments was to think of a character and I thought of a male character, um, maybe because it was farther away from me and my own experience. And I was really trying to work on fiction. Um, and the assignment was to pick one characteristic that um, this character has and to figure out how it works for that character in a good way and in a bad way. So I picked generosity. And mm -hmm. my male character was going to be super generous with like money and material things but very not generous with his love. Mm. And that was the beginning of Dylan, who's in that first short story. So that, that was, that's one way, you know, thinking about characters from a psychological perspective. And then, yeah, just taking, I like to think of the building of a character also like a collage, just taking bits and pieces of conversations I hear or people I know I might take how, one person I know looks and the job of another person or invent things, use my imagination. So it's just like this building collage of characteristics that somehow make this person who becomes really, this character who becomes real to me. Sure, that's, that's really interesting, you know, to take one attribute and look at both sides of it. And, you know, I feel like one of the themes of the book too is sort of that dichotomy of appearances versus reality. And I love that you'll notice that, you know, in many of the stories, there are characters who are sort of looking into mirrors and doing sort of a self-assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so interesting. And I thought I would ask you, you know, about place too, because I know that many of the stories either take place in New York or New Orleans, and I know that those are two settings that you're sort of intimately familiar with. So I'm wondering if you can talk about, you know, how placement helps in giving a story a sense of identity. Definitely. Um, I think I was just super lucky to have lived in two very rich places. Uh, the settings, New Orleans and New York, are just fascinating cities to write about. The people, the culture, food, music, um, all the different places you can, you know, shine a light on. So um, those two stories, those two places are super vibrant in the stories. And um, yeah, I, you know, I think you can invent and write about places you haven't been, but there definitely is a depth, I think, when you're writing from your own experiences or memories. Because when I write about New Orleans, those are really, really distant memories. I go visit sometimes, but the city's not the same as when I was growing up. Right. Yeah, and I love too, I love that, you know, setting be can become its own character. I know that some people say that that's ridiculous, but I tend to disagree with them because I think it can give, you know, a whole different sort of tonality to story if it's done well. Um, so let me ask you too, one thing I loved about this is obviously, you know, the subject matter tends to be serious because it's about relationships between men and women. And, you know, it can be romantic relationships, friendships, parenthood, um, but there's inherent drama, you know, in that. But I don't want people, you know, to get the idea that this is a somber book because, you know, there are those moments, but there's also, you know, a lot of levity and laughter throughout. So I'm wondering if you can talk about your relationship with humor and how that found its way into the book. Well, thank you for mentioning that because when I'm talking about the book, I often talk about, you know, the, the subject matters, the struggles, like I said, like probably the first thing when I started talking to you today. Right. Um, but there is humor. And um, I do appreciate that aspect of the book because it's really hard to sit through, you know, hundreds of pages of just heavy drama, at least for me. So I think humor um, is a way to make some things that are super difficult, more digestible. Sure. And I've learned a lot from reading people like Nathan Englander, who wrote um, What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank, because that story just really opened things up for me, because he was talking about religion, but in a funny way. And I liked that juxt juxtaposition of religion and humor. And sure. um, Philip Roth also, in his short story, The Conversion of the Jews. 
Like right. who could imagine you'd be, you know, hysterical laughing from a scene in the yeshiva. So um, that was a real challenge and a, an interesting, fun part of the writing journey for sure. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I can really appreciate that as a reader because it sort of gives you that, you know, moment to relax. But also I can imagine that's hard as a writer to find the balance because, of course, we want to be respectful of things. But at the same point, I think in our private lives, you know, we all have to find, you know, some laughter and humor. And if we don't, we go a little bit mad. Um, yeah. Or maybe that's just me, but I don't yes. <laughs> yeah, and um, you're right, that respect is part of it too, because you, there is a fine line. Yeah, but you gave some great examples, you know, of learning tools, you know, and then you see that other people have done it and they've done it well, and then it's like, okay, you know, you can do this and people aren't going to go for your head, um, which yeah. I think is terrific. And then more generally, I just, I wanted to ask you about the format of a short story, if you don't mind, because it's kind of, you know, a unique animal, and I know that many novelists you know, who will write hundreds and hundreds of pages in a book are intimidated by the idea of having to capture story in such a short span of time. So, you know, having written many now, can you tell us what you find to be both the greatest challenges and liberties in writing in this format? Yeah, for me, short stories actually were much easier than a novel. So what happened was I started really slowly just publishing one story at a time and playing around with, um, you know, the first person, third person, male character, female character, and just getting my bearings. And it, it was a manageable um, form because I could, I was had young kids at the time and I was able to read the whole draft like in a sitting. And, and kind of after like my third or fourth publication, I was like, I'm going to try a novel thinking like, well, it's just going to be a little longer, you know? And, and that to me was not only a totally different animal, but um, much harder for me to grasp because I didn't have the time to sit and focus. And I, I would have to put the story away. And then by the time I got back into it and looked at it again, I was starting all over again because I don't remember where I was and, and, and get back to that emotional beat. So the first draft of the novel that I wrote turned out to be kind of like a long, short story. Sure. That was the feedback I got. So for me, that's just to say short story writing was a more natural form for me. And I've worked really, really hard. I actually have a novel coming out in August, August 2022. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm excited. It's called The Marriage Box. And I'm really happy with how it came out. I, although I will say it took a lot of work. I mean, a lot. Many, many I edits. Imagine. And I decades. Think <laughs> yeah, I mean, the nice thing about a short story, and I don't mean this to put it down because it's not, short stories can be incredibly hard to write because you have to capture, you know, so much in a small amount of space. But I think a lot of people like the idea that the end is within sight. It's not 400 pages away. And that in and of itself, I think, makes it an easier entry point just because you know that the end is probably reachable. Um, but that's exciting news about the novel. So I'm going to ask thank you more you. about that at the end of this interview. Yeah, thank you. If you thank don't you. mind. Sure. And so I wanted to ask you too, you mentioned before that you came to writing um, in your 30s. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, what have you found to be your greatest teachers? Because you mentioned also, you know, that you studied writing a bit more formally, but you're, you know, a wife, a mom, a grandmother now. So I'm sure life has been a teacher as well. Um, yeah. So how do you sort of combine those things into your writing, what you've been taught by life versus what's been taught to you by other writers? Well, I definitely have um, learned from so many sources. Um, I spent a lot of years reading with a pencil in my hand, circling, underlining, taking notes in the margins, like really just trying to dissect what was going on. Um, I didn't have, you know, I, I always say this, I got through graduate school with only having taken one English class. I, I don't know how that's possible, but I felt like I needed to educate myself. And so I did that for uh, many years. I also took classes at Gotham Writers Workshop in New York City, which I highly recommend. They're giving classes now on Zoom now, so you can be anywhere in the country, and I, I think the world, and take classes from Gotham. Their teachers are amazing. Um, and I have gone to conferences across the country, I mean, I, workshops. I have, I've really done everything because I knew that, you know, there are many ways to get published and a lot of people can write something in a year or two or three and just get it out. And that was never my goal. My goal was really to write the best thing I could write 
And so I was very willing to take my time and go slowly and and work on my craft until I got it to be how, exactly how I wanted it to be. Sure, that's terrific. And I, I think there's a beauty in that. And, you know, knowing that you can actually take the time to do it in the way that you want to do it. And it doesn't always have to be a rush because so many people feel that pressure to produce, 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 and then they lose kind of all of the joy. And it doesn't really have to be that way. Um, but so now I'm going to ask you, you know, about the acknowledgement section in your book, because I am a junkie for those. I love to read them. And, uh -huh. and I saw Danny Shapiro's name pop up and I said, ooh, because I love her. She's one of my favorite writers. And she wrote, I think, one of the best books, you know, on the craft of writing ever. Every time I read it, you know, something new um, pops out. So what a great teacher to have. But I actually wanted to ask you specifically about your mom and your dad, because, you know, it seems that you learned a lot from them. Dad is a storyteller and mom is a tennis player. So I'm wondering if you can expand on that for us. Yeah. So, um, my parents were um, athletes. So reading and um, like, you know, even academics were, were not like the top priority. I went to a really great school in New Orleans. Like I'm so proud of my school and, and all that I learned there. But in my family, athletics and sports were really valued. So I saw them being competitive. I saw them being winners. I saw them like really pursuing their their sport with such passion and dedication and i think that that really translated into like once i figured out what my passion was going to be like how to use those tools to make this happen right for myself yeah because it's been a journey it's been a journey and you know for anybody out there who's listening who wants to write rejection is a huge part of this process and you have to have really thick skin and you have to be willing to just try and try again because there's going to be a reader out there somewhere who wants to hear what you have to say and some people find it immediately and some people have to work really hard to get it and I just think there are a lot of people who give up too soon so I learned yeah. from my parents to, to fight for what you want. Yeah, it's terrific. I mean you're right how you know watching your mom is just get the ball over the net you know and there's so much truth to that. And I have a lot of friends, you know, who are writers and sometimes, you know, they'll send an email and say, ah, another rejection. And my sort of response always to them. And it's so easy for me to say because I have not published a lot of writing and I have not been <laughs> putting a lot of writing out there. But, you know, I feel like sort of every no is just one step closer to yes. And, you know, because you found the wrong person, well, maybe you're now on the track um, to the right person. So it's interesting that you would say that. And I think such good advice. And I wanted to ask you too, you know, you've written short stories, but you've also written an abundance of personal essays. And so, you know, I speak to a lot of novelists, a lot of people who write fiction and have maybe dabbled in memoir or autobiography. And they say sometimes that they actually find, you know, that there's more of an essence of actual truth in their fiction than in what they write that's nonfiction. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, having written both you know, pretty much continuously. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I have been um, told, like, I can't believe how honest you are. So I think even in my um, nonfiction writing, I, I think it's not worth writing if you're not going to be honest. So I really go for that. Um, but I do really enjoy the freedom of fiction. I, 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 I prefer it. Sure. Usually, I can sit down uh, and write fiction. It, it's more, it's more fun for me. Sure. And so, to follow up on that, um, let me just ask you if you have, you know, any words of advice or guidance for people who are struggling, you know, with whether or not they want to write actual autobiography or memoir, or if they should fictionalize something. Would you have any guidance as to how they might want to, you know, consider that before they actually sit sure. down and do the writing? Like I said, I think that if you're not going to be truthful you shouldn't bother because readers will not be interested. If you don't hit that emotional beat, nobody's gonna care. So I think you have to really care about it and be honest. And if you can sit down and write memoir and, and be honest, then go for it, you should do it. And if it's gonna hold you back because you're thinking, what is my mother gonna say and my sister and my brother and whoever else, um, then go to fiction. And you can always just say it's fiction. And there will be people who challenge you and people who, you know, aren't happy, but it does give you a little more freedom. Sure. I love that. And I love, you know, when people sort of take real characters and fictionalize them and then they worry 
that the people are going to recognize themselves, particularly <laughs> the people who have, you know, negative attributes. And then they get the feedback that that person does not recognize that character, but realizes, you know, how offensive and awful that they are. <laughs> and they say, I can't believe somebody like this exists. And they're actually exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just a couple more questions for you. And then I will let you get back to, you know, real life in writing. Um, you've already actually given us some, you know, great advice and words of wisdom, but I'm going to come back to that because a lot of people are always seeking that. So I know you spoke to us specifically, you know, about rejection and sort of how to use that as a positive framework. But I'm wondering too, you know, in terms of a creative or writing life, what do you think is the best advice that you were ever given and then the best advice that you were never given and had to learn throughout the process of doing it for yourself? Wow. The best advice I was ever given. Hmm. I mean, I, I think I'll go back to um, the idea of my parents and, and you know, persevering. I, I think in this field, if you're not going to persevere, you know, very few are going to make it. That's great advice. True. So, yeah, um, I, I really, I, I believe that. I mean, you know, I, I participate in so many online, like, writing groups, and the amount of queries that writers are sending out, the amount of rejection, the amount of being ignored, never hearing back, waiting a year, waiting more than a year, and then being asked for a full manuscript, and then the agent might ghost you or I mean the stories are endless by really great writers and some of them even have two books already published right. I mean I'm not even talking about somebody just starting out I'm talking about people who have published or in the writing world and it's just a really hard time right now you've got to be super serious no, if you want true. It's so true. And I'm wondering, is there anything that you also have learned that was kind of an epiphany moment that you didn't realize until you started, you know, writing yourself? And then you said, oh, I wish I maybe knew this then. Um, you know, I, I think I was really lucky with this whole process because I didn't start out saying, I want to be a writer um, and I'm going to make this happen. It was a really slow journey. It was just, can I get one short story published? Right. And then after that one was published, I was like, oh, was that just a lucky break? Can I get two done? Then three. Then let me try a novel. And, and it was really, and then, then once I started having a few stories, once I had a few stories published and my novel was like, you know, almost done, then I started really thinking about myself as a writer. Like my, everything had changed inside myself by that point. And then I was um, determined, sure. really determined. Yeah. In the beginning, I was a little bit playing and seeing what I could do. And then once I got determined and saw how difficult it would, was going to be, everything changed. But I, I do think that because I didn't start out like um, with a specific goal in mind, it wasn't like there was any one epiphany. It was just a, a slow process. And, um, and the determination came, you know, little by little, as I set right. new goals for myself. Right. Actually, I love, you know, that approach to just take it sort of a manageable step at a time, like building blocks and, okay, now I've accomplished this. Mm -hmm. Can I accomplish that? I think that if other people came at it from that perspective, it might be more beneficial to them because there's not that huge pressure of, you know, I need to write the great American novel or best-selling book, and then I need to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So I'm following it away from my own, you know, note here. I'm like, okay, that's what it's got to be, just a little at a time and you build some momentum. Um, but that's yeah. a terrific perspective. So thank you for they, sharing that. I mean, writers talk about that even in terms of daily writing when people get stuck. It's like, if you sit down and say, I'm going to write something brilliant today, like you're just going to be totally stuck. You just have to like come to the page and say, I'm going to write something today. I'm just going to yeah. write. Yeah. It's true. Sometimes I say, I'm going to write complete crap today. And then I do and I feel accomplished. And exactly. if it's not complete crap, I feel even better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Exactly. So final question to you. I'm wondering if you can leave us with a little teaser of what comes next. It can be more stories, essays, or you mentioned the marriage box. I think it was yes. that's coming out in August. So yes. feel free to tell us whatever you were at liberty to tell us and want to tell us. Okay, great. So the marriage box will be out in August of 2022. 
I am really excited about that book. It took me a very long time to write, but I think I finally got the right note. And um, I'm very, very thrilled with how it came out. It's a fun read. Um, the setting is New Orleans and New York again. Mm -hmm. um, you meet some similar characters that you met in Life and Other Shortcomings, um, some same themes, but um, it's a novel. It uh, takes place in the 80s. And um, yeah, I'm really excited about that. And after that, I have another novel that um, I will be hopefully getting out a few years after that. I would love to write more short stories and essays. Um, I really do feel in many ways since I got started late that I'm just starting and it's exciting and I'm hoping to write for many more years. Oh, well, we hope that too. That's terrific. It's nice to have that to look forward to. And in the meantime, you know, people have to read Life and Other Shortcomings. And if they read it slowly, which you will not do, I mean, you start reading this, it, you'll read it in a day. It's that good and engrossing. But if you want to stretch it out, you know, there's 12 stories. So if you read about one story a month, by the time you're done, the novel <laughs> will be out. So, you know, Okay, my math isn't terrific. It's more like, what, nine months? It's eight, fine. Nine. It takes people a day or two to read the book usually, so. Pace yourselves, pace yourselves. Exactly. <laughs> that's sort of the, the theme it's for the day, right? Is pace yourself. Pace yourself, yeah. It's a, um, Life and Other Shortcomings has been a great vacation read. You take it on a plane, you know, you're, you're you know, done before you land <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. yeah, depends Don't, where you go. It's very true. And you know what I would say too? It was a great vacation read for me and I did not leave my house. I barely leave my house these days, but you know, I think that's the beauty of stories is that they take you to another world. Like I can lay in my bed and all of a sudden I'm in New York or New Orleans meeting all of these great characters. Um, so even, you know, if you're not going anywhere, you will be going somewhere with this book. So you got to pick it up. Corey Ashby, Life and Other Shortcomings. Thank you so much for doing this today. Thanks so much for having me here. This was really fun. That was my great pleasure. Right, let me stop us from That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.